Good afternoon. I want to welcome everybody to today's webinar. We're going to be talking about Beyond Lead, Green Building Standards and Regulations that are changing the marketplace. I'm Tad Rodzinski, and I'll be hosting the webinar today, and I really appreciate everyone for joining. Uh, the way the webinar will work is I will run through uh, a series of slides and go through the presentation. During the webinar, you have the ability using your uh, taskbar on the go to webinar screen to basically type in questions and uh, if you type in your questions I'll be answering them at the end I'll probably go for about 40 45 minutes on the dis uh, discussion and the slides and then we'll have uh, anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes for question and answers and the questions usually make these webinars uh, much more interesting as far as getting people to ask uh, things that are important to them so we'll definitely uh, look forward to seeing your questions, and like I said, I'll be glad to answer them. Uh, one reason that I wanted to do this webinar is because there's so much attention that goes out to the LEED rating system, but there's so many other initiatives, uh, standards, and codes, and other programs out in the market that are you know, definitely pushing and changing the market. And That's one of the reasons I thought this would be a very good idea. Also, for people that are selling uh, you know, building products or who are in the construction market or, you know, working on buildings or managing buildings. There's a lot of things to be aware of in regard to these different uh, codes, standards, and other programs that are out there. And one thing that I always see as well is, you know, we are in this age right now where there's a lot of transparency discussion. There's a lot of information being uh, disseminated with environmental product declarations and health product declarations. And Everybody's doing it, you know, because of the lead version four. But as you'll see today, there's there's also multiple other standards and codes that basically reference life cycle or award points, or you can meet the code requirements because of having a life cycle assessment or an EPD. And I just think it's important for people to know that. So this will be a, a presentation of, a, like I said, lots of different uh, codes, activities, standards that are out there. And again, uh, feel free to ask questions as we go through, and I will address them at the end. So we'll get started. Today, uh, you know, we do know that uh, green building is definitely a major part of our marketplace. Uh, you can't, there's, there's, I think it was the 20,000th building was just certified in LEED. Uh, there's also a number of organizations that are, you know, adopting uh, green building codes. We'll talk about California shortly, but this is definitely a major part of the market, and, and I think if we look at what has happened over the years, originally when the United States Green Building Council created the LEED standard, I think they really wanted to change the market. And that market change has come in various different programs, initiatives, other standards, other requirements that are out there. And that that's a really positive thing because we do all know that there is a tremendous amount of impact from operating buildings. There's, there's definitely impacts from building buildings. But operating them, there, there's uh, a lot of impact. So it's important that we really try to make our buildings as sustainable as possible, especially with the fact that you know we have a growing population in the world, uh, over 7 billion people, and we have a, another 3 billion people that want to migrate into the global middle class and all live like many of us on this call. So figuring out a way to make these buildings more efficient, number one, when they're built, but also existing buildings is really important. So I can also tell you that green building with the, the advent of codes coming out, especially in California, green building is definitely going from voluntary to mandatory. And another thing we have to be aware of, and uh, I don't know if you're all uh, paying attention to this, but there's a tremendous amount of activity right now around sustainable purchasing. And we'll be talking about that as we go through here. And I think sustainable purchasing is definitely going to influence the building and construction market. It's going to uh, basically influence the way we operate buildings and campuses and you know all kinds of different things. So it's really important to be aware of that. And then, uh, as I mentioned, transparency is a major market force. But again, there's more to that than just lead version four on why transparency is really important. As you can see here, here's a series of different green building uh, codes and standards. Uh, we're all aware with lead, uh, and you know that's that's one we're definitely familiar with, but you know, there's also the California Green Building Standards Code that was just updated in 2013. We call that CalGreen, and the International Green Construction Code, which is was rolled out in 2012, but is actually going through an update right now. 
And then let's not forget for homes, uh, there's also the National Association of Home Builders has the National Green Building Standard. And this standard is uh, just recently updated and we are seeing a tremendous amount of use with that uh, as more and more homes are being built you know, post-recession. Uh, Along with all these different codes and standards, though, here's also another a very partial list of other programs that are out in the marketplace. And I'm not going to read these, but if you're looking at this screen, you can just see there's a lot of different requirements, codes, standards, uh, some voluntary, some mandatory, that are being utilized and being pushed and they you know there's even specifics around uh, areas in the in the country like Alameda County or Scottsdale Arizona they have their own programs Phoenix you know so again keep in mind that all of these different uh, programs definitely can be utilized definitely have an influence and uh, we do a lot of work in the energy star area uh, a lot of times we're certifying uh, buildings and plants to Energy Star. We're always doing a lot of benchmarking and energy analysis. So, you know, a lot of these things are utilized uh, in multiple basis. And even thinking about if we go back to LEED, for example, Energy Star is a major component of LEED certification as well as National Green Building Standard. Uh, there's definitely energy requirements in all the, uh, like Cal Green and International Green Construction Code. So, all these different tools that we have out there to help us make buildings more sustainable. And, you know, we do know that uh, as green building goes from more voluntary to mandatory, uh, the folks that are really in the trenches every day that are doing this work, you know, basically doing LEED certifications, NGBS certifications, or even Energy Star, uh, you know, there's a, there's a small contingent that, of that compared to the overall market that's really out there. And in reality, as these codes that become law come into force, we're going to have a whole series of people that really didn't really care about green that really have to start to care about it because they're going to be required to meet the requirements. And one thing I can't really iterate enough is it's, in, it's imperative that all of us really think about how we're going to make existing buildings more sustainable. Uh, it's really great to get a building and, and focus on it when it's being built and do the right thing and you know make it as efficient as possible and you know, maximize uh, the use of resources, minimize impacts, all that kind of thing. But that's only a, one small segment of all the buildings in the world. And really trying to figure out how to improve the sustainability of how we operate these buildings is going to be really essential. Uh, think about it, there's millions of existing buildings that need improvements. And really, this is a tremendous opportunity for saving money and reducing impacts. And as we look at the situation, you know, with uh, climate change and, and global warming and, you know, all these water scarcity in many areas, uh, going back to these existing buildings and coming up with a means of adapting them, retrofitting them, renovating them, going to be really important. The picture I show on this slide is actually a building that we've been working on for a number of years. We started out doing an energy audit, an ASHRAE Level 1 audit on this building back in 2007 or eight. And we knew that the building had an Energy Star score at the time of a 60. We've done various things in this building to improve efficiency. A lot of them were very low and no cost. The Energy Star rating on this building now is an 82. Uh, it's been Energy Star certified for, for about four years straight. It's also a lead gold building for uh, existing buildings and operations. And uh, it's just been a great success story. It's saved the owners a lot of money. It's saved the tenants a lot of money. It's reduced consumption of water. Uh, so a lot of great things have been done in this building. And there's plenty of opportunities to do that and many others. We also have to realize, you know, we're seeing a lot of activity out there also with, uh, I said before, transparency, environmental product declarations, health product declarations being published. and we have to remember that LEED is not the only standard that references these. Number one, it's excellent information that we're getting out to the marketplace. If you think about it, uh, we never had this kind of data at our fingertips. For any of you that are really well versed in LCA or looking at life cycle impacts of products, if you did not have a subscription to Simapro or Gabby or some software, or you weren't well, well trained in this, you really didn't have a lot of access. But now, with uh, all these, this activity, and I do give the 
uh, lead version 4 some credit for this because it definitely pushed the market, we now have at our fingertips a lot of information about various building products and we can really see firsthand what some of these impacts are. So number one, we want to use this when we're evaluating products and selecting products but it's also imperative that anybody, any manufacturer that's published one of these uses that life cycle assessment data to really improve their products. Uh, once you know the life cycle impacts of the product, you can basically integrate this into a sustainable product design program and you can really re focus on reducing the impacts. If you look at the intent of what lead version 4 has is in regard to EPDs, the intent really is to get the manufacturers to publish the data but then to use that to make the products more sustainable or greener as I call it. So again very important aspect but you're going to see in a few minutes that there's probably five, six or more other standards and codes that actually reference life cycle and an EPD can be used for all of them. It just doesn't have to meet the you know one point in a lead standard. But most importantly, like I said, the manufacturer should be really using that life cycle data to understand those impacts and make their products much more sustainable. Uh, I, I chatted about some of this already, but you know this is definitely recognized by other green building standards and codes. Uh, another key thing, we're going to talk shortly about sustainable supply chain and uh, sustainable purchasing. And I can tell you, uh, I'm uh, one of the founding members of the Sustainable Purchasing Leadership Council. And in that organization, uh, there's going to be a lot of standards developed around different product categories on what is and what is not sustainable purchasing and what is sustainable products. And it is definitely going to be life cycle based. There's going to be life cycle information as well as uh, some means of capturing what are the social impacts of the different products and uh, services that are utilized on an ongoing basis by many different organizations. Another great thing about LCAs is you know, they definitely can help identify areas for improvement and cost savings. Uh, we have conducted many life cycle assessments where we found cost savings during the assessment process. Typically in our process, we go and we visit the manufacturing facility. So we're in the, in the plant and we're seeing what's going on as far as how things are made, what the construction is, uh, you know, what raw materials are being used, how energy is being used. And I can honestly say just about every plant we've ever gone to, we found cost-saving opportunities. And uh, in some cases, it was considerable. Um, one, one example comes to mind where we had visited a facility. We did an analysis for their life cycle assessment. We found out they were using a lot of propane. We also found out they were using a lot of water compared to what they should do. We made some simple recommendations around improving the use of the propane in their equipment. And then uh, based on our analysis, we determined they had a leak somewhere they found the leak that was equivalent to four million gallons a year that was leaking that they were paying for. Uh, tremendous waste of water. Uh, wasn't a huge cost savings because water is so inexpensive, which is unfortunate. But the propane savings amounted to um, almost two hundred thousand dollars a year by with only a five thousand dollar investment to make some changes. So that paid off big time for that company and that's just one example of multiple times we're in these operations really understanding how these things can can pay off and like I mentioned before using that information by the manufacturer as part of a sustainable product development program is really important so if we just look at some of the these are some of the things I want to talk about some of the different standards and codes we, we talked about lead and I'm not going to go into any more on that right now but I do want to talk some more about the National Green Building Standard. Uh, for those of you not familiar with that, it is uh, primarily focused on residential construction. We're going to talk about CalGreen, which is a mandatory code in California. The International Green Construction Code is a code that gets adopted by various uh, states, counties, and municipalities and basically integrated into their code requirements for building buildings. In most cases, it's not going to replace the uh, building code, it's going to be an add-on where the municipality or the, the local government is going to basically say, all right, International Green Construction Code is integrated by reference and must be met along with uh, the standard building codes that are utilized by that, that entity. So we'll talk more about that. And then Green Globes uh, is a voluntary standard. It's, it's very similar to a LEED standard in the fact that you know, you're, you're basically evaluating the construction of a building and it's you get awarded instead of a, a lead gold silver um, 
or platinum plaque, you're getting awarded a number of globes. And you know, this is a voluntary standard. However, it's uh, been adopted by the Canadian federal government for its entire real estate por portfolio. It's also a, a standard that is uh, been recognized by U.S. Uh, by the GSA as a green as a program for assessing uh, the performance of federal buildings and improving that performance. So, along with LEED, Green Globes is also recognized. And you'll see in a little bit in a little bit too. There's uh, quite a number of uh, government agencies and uh, corporations and owners that are not using LEED anymore. They might be going to Green Globes, and uh, we'll explain some reasons why in a second here. So, as I mentioned, when we were thinking about Green Globes, uh, this is something that was just published recently. Uh, I don't know if you've seen this in the news, but you're, we're starting to see a number of states that are making resolutions that basically is saying, okay, we're no longer going to endorse the LEED certification system. A lot of these states are uh, states that have either uh, large uh, timber, pulp, and paper uh, operations within their states, uh, and a lot of that has to do with the, the uh, Forest Stewardship Council. You know, the fact that the LEED rating system only recognizes FSC, many of these states have decided, okay, we're no longer going to endorse LEED because it's not open to other uh, forest certifications and things like that. So. This particular one that I'm showing on the screen here was just recently released, and there's a group of uh, manufacturers out there that um, have formed an organization. They're they're definitely uh, unhappy with the new lead standards because it's, it's you know their opinion is it's delving away from uh, actual focus on buildings and more of a focus on products and and that kind of thing. And uh, this group was effective in getting the state of Ohio Senate to pass a resolution that basically is not recognizing LEED uh, as a system because there's a lot of uh, manufacturers in that state that are not happy with the uh, transparency requirements within the LEED standard. So we're starting to see more of that. And this is just an example of a building that was certified to Green Globes um, by an organization that you know is definitely interested in having alternatives other than LEED. So it's not just governments. We're seeing corporations also adopting other standards out there and, and bringing them in uh, on a full basis here. One interesting thing is, uh, just like I mentioned before, Green Globes definitely has a life cycle assessment path. And it can be both a uh, performance path or prescriptive. And it fully recognizes environmental product declarations. So as if you're a manufacturer or if you're an architect or a builder and you're thinking you're just going to use uh, an EPD only for LEED version 4. This is one other standard where it definitely applies. And I think it's important to be aware of this because you know everybody keeps talking about getting one point in, in one building standard when we have the capability here to earn points in other systems. So any of you that are even manufacturers that are thinking about EPDs, remember it's not just LEED that this will apply to. Uh, the next thing I wanted to talk about was the National Green Building Standard, uh, NGBS. And uh, National Green Building Standard is, uh, they had the unfortunate uh, problem of rolling the standard out right at the beginning of the recession when, you know, basically all housing construction stopped in the U.S. and, you know, major downturn in the construction market. But this standard is a very good standard. It's uh, ANSI-based. It went through an ANSI process, uh, so there was a consensus-based uh, group to, that developed the standard, and it focuses mainly on residential construction, and that would include both uh, single family and multifamily construction. But the interesting thing is, all along they had a credit or a practice in here, 610.1 on life cycle analysis, and there's various ways you can earn points within this standard by selecting products using life cycle. Um, it could be right down to a single product or it can even earn points by doing whole building LCA, or there's even a comparative analysis available here. If you look at this, number three here, two or more products with the same intended use are compared against an LCA of the product at least, and then they're looking for at least 15% improvement. So when I was saying earlier, if you publish an EPD and you're a manufacturer, great, but you better be using that to make your product more you know, greener or low, you know, reduce those impacts because there is that initiative in many standards coming where um, there's going to be comparative analysis coming in the future. 
And that's a great marketing thing for you if you're a manufacturer to be able to say, hey, yeah, we ran our baseline LCA. Here were the impacts. We made a bunch of changes to our operations and our manufacturing and also into our raw materials, transportation, whatever you're going to do. And here's where we are now. We have, you know, 50% reduction here, 20% reduction in maybe global warming. So really important that you keep that aware. And, and all of us that are on the phone that are doing green building work or just really care about sustainable buildings or sustainable products, really great information. This just gives you some information uh, just so uh, most of you are aware. The National Green Building Standard is now managed by the Home Innovation Research Labs, HIRL, previously NHB. Uh, and they are in the process now of updating for a new 2015 edition, and they're accepting applications for people that are interested in serving on any consensus committees to develop this standard. Uh, this next, the bottom of this slide basically shows you the activity around uh, certifications within the NGBS. You can see single-family homes are, um, there's over 7,000 units certified, but another 2,000 in process. Uh, multifamily buildings, uh, they're almost up to, they have about a, 767 certified and roughly 938 in process. And if you look at that, um, this is actually, if you, if you consider that one multifamily building could have anywhere from, you know, three, two or three up to hundreds of units in it, you know, right now you're looking at roughly um, over, you know, close to 65,000 units that are going to be certified by this uh, standard. So now that the housing market's coming back, we're, we're seeing this standard being used quite a bit, and it is really ramping up. So keep that in mind if you're involved in multifamily or you're selling products in there or you're actually doing that work, that this is a viable alternative uh, for certifying buildings. And it's, it's very good. It's, I, I like this standard because it definitely has a lot of um, prescriptive requirements. It's very easy to understand. And the process of uh, doing the certification on this is all wet, pretty much web-based and, and pretty pretty straightforward. So it's a very good program. Now let's talk a little bit about the International Green Construction Code. Uh, this, like I said, this is a regulatory framework uh, for new and existing buildings. One thing about IGCC is it mainly only focuses on commercial buildings, and it does uh, offer different jurisdictions. That would be, you know, municipal governments. It could be uh, states state governments, counties, uh, cities, uh, towns, whatever, they can basically adopt this and, and add it right onto their existing building codes and make it by reference mandatory that, you know, uh, different builders or contractors, building owners meet the requirements in IGCC as far as green building goes. If you look at this, it definitely covers many of the same categories that you'll see in typical building standards. That would be energy efficiency, uh, resource efficiency, uh, energy, uh, water, you know, different things like that, indoor environmental quality, all of these things are covered within the IGCC. And what's really interesting is uh, there are quite a few different entities that have adopted this. And one thing that was surprising to me is um, I just saw that recently Texas adopted the IGCC. And you'll, I'll show you a map in a minute. But this shows me that there's, you're starting to get some traction here. And there is a new version of this being developed that is uh, open for public comment uh, very shortly. I think next week we should be some, see some things coming out. But there will be a 2015 version of this. I also know, if you look at this uh, map right here, all the green states are states that have adopted IGCC. And uh, remember, we're going to talk about California. Cal Green, the reason California hasn't adopted it is they have their own California Green Building Standards that are required for both uh, residential and commercial projects. And that's really interesting because in these particular areas now, if the states really adopt these, really enforce that their, their use, suddenly you're going to have maybe instead of a handful of buildings that are just seeking LEED or NGBS or some other voluntary certification, suddenly you're going to have all these different buildings and all these builders and architects that have never really cared about green building to raise awareness about that and start to really look at these codes and say, wow, man, I need products with recycled content or I need to meet energy efficiency standards or, you know, I have to do various things about water efficiency above and beyond what I'm used to. So you're going to see uh, a big opportunity here for really improving um, buildings in the future. And uh, 
Also, I, since I've been talking about life cycle assessments, Section 303 of the IGCC uh, definitely has uh, reference to whole building LCAs performed in accordance with um, you know, various requirements. And uh, it basically identifies here the different impact categories that must be evaluated as part of that whole building LCA. So again, it's, it's just really interesting to me to see how things are going. And uh, you know, I predicted long ago that we would start to see codes coming out and different things like that. And you know, I think we'll see more and more states and cities adopting this international green construction code as time goes on. Now let's talk a minute about CalGreen. Uh, CalGreen was published in January of 2011, and it really focuses on uh, buildings within California that are required to meet this green code. And there are uh, residential and non-residential mandatory measures in this code, but there's all, also voluntary measures. Uh, this was just updated in 2013, and uh, this particular code you know, is basically forcing, again, it's a code, so it's a law, that Anybody that's building a building within California must follow the mandatory requirements, and you know the voluntary requirements are listed in there that they can they can follow as well. Um, one thing I did want to measure mention, if I back up a minute to IGCC, IGCC, like I said, was commercial buildings only, and it typically has a threshold size on the building uh, that you have to you know a certain size that has to meet that code when it is adopted. So in California. I, there is no specific set requirement as far as the size of the building that is required. And again, if you're, if you're doing any kind of work in this state, you need to be aware that this exists. If you're, doing, uh, if you're a product manufacturer and doing any kind of work around products, this is a great opportunity depending on what your product does within a building, if it saves energy or if it has recycled content or it meets some of the attributes in here. It's a great way to let people know uh, actually a much bigger audience that your products can help meet the requirements of this California Green Building uh, Code. So anyway, I wanted to keep talking about life cycle assessment and the fact that uh, there is a section within the CalGreen, it's a voluntary measure, so it's not required, but it does require or have the ability for builders, architects, and different other folks to select materials and assemblies based on life cycle assessment. Uh, using various softwares. And the great thing is it re references Athena. It references uh, NIST, the Bees site. Uh, I don't have any slides on Bees, but Bees is actually a really good website. If you've never seen that, Bees allows you to look at different products and assemblies uh, that uh, have lifecycle data published. I believe there's probably close to 300 different products that are published in Bees. Uh, a lot of the students I work with, I teach them about bees because it's a quick and easy way to do an analysis of products if you're interested in finding life cycle data about them. And then this uh, voluntary measure within CalGreen also allows for you to uh, look at life cycle assessment that was done in accordance with ISO standards. ISO 14044 is the standard that requires uh, you know, various re uh, aspects of a LCA and that standard is definitely something that uh, all you'll see all the different codes and standards um, focusing on. Another one that I wanted to mention, and this is not specifically related to buildings, but it's more related to the uh, infrastructure of, say, a town or a city or a community. And this is the new uh, Institute for Sustainable Infrastructure Envision standard that's been published. And basically what this focuses on is looking at how uh, we get energy, water, waste, transportation, landscaping, information, uh, data exchanges, putting around uh, sustainability requirements for putting these infrastructure uh, for each of these in place. And as you can see here, it covers a lot of different things. I mean, energy looks at all types of energy sources. Uh, water looks at everything from stormwater management, flood control, to uh, wastewater and potable water. Uh, waste handling, you know, how is waste handled within a different community or a different city. Uh, transportation, it addresses all the major transportation aspects, uh, including roads and air, airports, biking, uh, pedestrians, public transit. And then really looking at information, you know, how do we get telecommunications? How do we handle satellites, data centers? So the standard's really interesting because this has been, you know, one issue with 
uh, like a big lack of information. You know, there was always a lot of uh, activity around buildings, but this is the first standard I've seen uh, around infrastructure. In fact, when I was teaching at uh, Temple University, I was teaching a class on sustainable community design and development for master's degree planning students, and uh, we had talked about trying to put around, put together something around what is sustainable infrastructure, how do we judge that, and how do we, we basically establish uh, requirements around that. So this ISI Envision Standard is one of the first that I've seen to do that. And the thing I wanted to point out in here is what's really interesting is, is if you look at this, uh, these are just some of the different uh, credit areas that you can address, but you know some of the things they're looking at is reducing net embodied energy of, of materials and products. Uh, again, that comes back to life cycle. You, you know, to really understand what is the embodied energy of your product, you you typically have to do a life cycle assessment to evaluate all the energy inputs, all the raw material inputs. Uh, also, supporting sustainable procurement practices. So. As I mentioned earlier, sustainable purchasing is going to be something that we see a lot of coming here in the near future. So keep that in mind as we uh, look at um, different standards like this, uh, reducing energy consumption, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So again, if you're not aware of the standard, it's definitely keep an eye on that, especially if you're selling you know, products or you're working in a, a community where you're, you're focused on uh, you know, these type of things, such as you know, maybe designing roadways or you know, piping infrastructure, water systems, you know, energy systems, things like that. Next one I want to talk about is the Living Building Challenge. Uh, this is something that has come out of, you know, uh, folks that are very interested in LEED. And basically what the focus is on Living Building Challenge is designing buildings to be more restorative and regenerative uh, in the environment. It's got a lot of traction out in uh, the West Coast, you know, there's a whole uh, group out there, Cascadia uh, area, have done a great job of really putting this standard together. And really, if you think about it, this standard, its focus is really to look at a building and to try to make that building um, as close to net zero or regenerative as possible. And what I mean by that is, basically, if you look at the building, you would calculate how much sunlight falls on that building on an average year and try to design your energy systems to utilize only that much energy. It also looks at water use, it looks at the materials that go in, and uh, this has actually started a lot of the discussions and concerns around uh, you know, banning or putting a red list out about not having different chemicals or materials in various uh, buildings. And as you can see here, this is the Living Building Challenge red list of chemicals. Uh, this has got companies like Google starting their own red list, this, this Living Building Challenge that just came out. And, uh, and I don't mean just came out, it's been out for quite a while, but it, this, this list of chemicals is getting lots of attention, especially among manufacturers of products, especially if they ha they're making these products. So you can see here there's all kinds of different things covered, formaldehyde, mercury, PVC, wood treatments, you know, different things like that. And there are different exceptions within the red list, you know, for example, uh, one example would be, say, a hardware. You know, if you have a door door hardware on your uh, door, oftentimes there's brass in that, and there is some lead in that brass. And if it's below a certain percentage, or if it's uh, embedded in the product, then uh, that particular product could still be used in the building. So this is gaining some attention. There are some groups around the country that are starting uh, Living Building Challenge sec sections. I know there's one being formed here in the Philadelphia area. I know there's another one that's getting started up in uh, Connecticut. So, and I'm sure there's others, but you know, we are seeing this starting to get a little more attention here. Uh, I would say that this is definitely uh, a great way to think as far as making buildings uh, almost zero impact or regenerative. However, it is very controversial among many folks around banning certain chemicals and products and materials. So, you know, again, keep that in mind. But I, I think, you know, there's going to be really no perfect standard out there. Every standard is going to have pluses and minuses. The bottom line is I think we all really need to just care about making buildings more sustainable so we do have a sustainable future. So when we look at net zero buildings, this is a one area also that's getting a lot of attention. You're going to see a lot of this happening within the military. Um, I know the Army has a net zero initiative now for uh, energy, water, and waste that they're publishing. 
And net zero really means that the building will generate enough electricity to meet its annual energy needs. And, and it doesn't mean you have to be off the grid. What it means is you have to be able to produce either re, you know, a combination of reduction of energy consumption and production of energy. So you're almost like a self-supporting building. Uh, and we have worked on a couple of these where we're, we're heavily focused on getting them as close to net zero as possible. I know in my own home, I have solar panels on my home. I've done a lot of work to reduce my energy consumption. I'm not exactly at net zero. I'm very close. Uh, and, you know, I know I do have a lot of people I know that are net zero. Uh, actually, they're probably uh, generating more than they use in certain areas. And uh, I think that we're, we're a little bit limited on technology to allow us to hit this. It's also the way we think, the way we design. But there, you're going to see a lot more activity around this, and it's really important to keep that in mind, that this is something that's coming. In fact, uh, there are a number of municipalities that are developing policies for net zero building, uh, especially out in Arizona and Colorado, even in Austin, Texas. We all do, you know, many of you may know that Austin has been a leader in uh, the green building movement. Uh, they have their own standards there, and uh, they now are really endorsing this net zero uh, direction. And you can see uh, they started this in October 2007, uh, whereas, you know, some of these other uh, our organizations like Boulder County and uh, Arizona might not be as recent. So, again, this is something that to really consider. And I think if you're a building products manufacturer and you make products that are related to energy savings, you know, whether it's uh, windows or doors or, um, you know, HVAC equipment or, you know, even renewable energy systems, you want to pay attention to this. Or, or even appliances. Think about it. Um, you know, there's a lot of companies that make appliances that we use. Anything that's consuming energy or generating energy, you probably want to pay attention to this because net zero, uh, in my opinion, is the way we really have to go. And uh, you're looking at the rapid growth that we have in developing countries like China and India. You know, if they don't do something like this, you're, if you've seen images on t the television recently of all the smog and pollution within China, it's not going to get any better if, if, if we don't figure out ways to, you know, basically power buildings, um, you know, in a renewable manner using heavy, heavy focus on energy efficiency. Um, we're going to continue to have issues like you're seeing in China right now. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention is some other big drivers for change in, in buildings is going to be executive orders, executive order 13514. Uh, this one is really pushing federal agencies to focus heavily on how much energy they use, what is their carbon footprint, come up with strategies to reduce that. And this one was signed by uh, uh, President Obama uh, early in his term. And uh, I know that there's a, quite a few agencies out there that are being pushed to meet this requirement. And first thing they were doing is benchmarking, measuring uh, how much energy they use, measuring their carbon footprint. Now a lot of them are figuring out strategies on how they're going to reduce that. And it's a combination of energy efficiency initiatives, some renewable energy, some redesign of systems. So, you know, definitely some good things going on with these executive orders. And again, they're not, some of them may reference LEED or they may reference other green building standards, but mostly they're looking at making buildings more sustainable. So again, keep that in mind. Another one I want to mention quickly is energy disclosure. Uh, we just recently had this pass in Philadelphia. Uh, and what this is, is certain states or, or certain cities actually, and, and some states are really looking at this, are requiring that buildings of a certain size have to report their energy consumption publicly. And what they do, they you utilize uh, Energy Star Portfolio Manager to uh, basically put in all your utility bills, the number of occupants, the uh, number of computers, the different uses in the building, and it generates a score for that particular building. And uh, what these energy disclosure laws are requiring is these uh, different buildings to report this information. And probably one of the biz biggest successes have been, has been New York City that required this law. And uh, they had, uh, the first year, they had an 80% compliance rate with reporting. And they've taken it a step further now where this information is made public. And uh, let's say that I'm looking to lease some space or buy a building in New York City. I now can go onto the website and I can look at how much energy is being used in that building. And I can say, wow, here this building's Energy Star score is a 50, which is 
average, and this one's an 85, I know this building is going to use less energy. I'm going to, I'm going to either going to lease this building or try to buy this building because, you know, it's definitely much more energy efficient. So this is getting a lot of traction. It's starting to really ramp up. Like I said, it just started in Philly here recently, but uh, Washington, D.C. has done it. And um, the ultimate goal is to basically get this out in the public realm and, and basically almost force uh, building owners, since you know this is public information now, to start taking measures to improve the energy efficiency within their buildings. So keep that that in mind, and uh, uh, that's that's a really important aspect. Uh, when we talk about, I mentioned earlier about sustainable purchasing, and uh, there is a major movement now among uh, Department of Defense, the General Services Administration. There's the Sustainable Purchasing Leadership Council really around developing standards on what are sustainable products, including building materials. There's a heavy focus on LCA and product transparency. And uh, this is something that, you know, if you're working on, if you sell products to the government or you design buildings for the government or, you know, you're involved in that, you want to consider this because this is something that's going to be coming. It's, it's, not hap it's not right this minute, but there's a lot of activity around it. And... You know, even this information that I show on this slide from the U.S. Army about their net zero initiative, you know, the Army, for sure, the DOD, is definitely looking for products and materials and uh, design techniques that are going to help them reduce their reliance on foreign energy and re reduce their reliance on energy overall because it's a big risk to them. So keep that in mind. Uh, I did mention the Sustainable Purchasing Leadership Council. Uh, this is a great organization that's uh, just coming uh, into being. And there's uh, quite a number of uh, groups that have joined this uh, as founding members and other organizations now. And uh, what you're going to be seeing in the very near future is uh, basically standards on defining what is sustainable purchasing. And then there's going to be movement on developing standards around sustainable products, you know, what defines a sustainable product. So I'm pretty excited about this because I think this is really what's needed. You know, we hear all the time, oh, my product, is, you know, this product has recycled content. Does that mean it's sustainable? Or, you know, does this product, you know, might have uh, a, you know, bio-based materials. Does that mean it's sustainable? Well, this this group is looking to set standards on that, and you're going to see probably uh, government organizations and other institutions really focusing on that. Just a couple more slides here, and I'm going to get into uh, some questions and answers. I am getting some questions coming in here. Uh, the Mayor's Office of uh, Sustainability, I wanted to also point out that there's major initiatives in many cities around greening of their organizations, greening of the city, greening of the buildings. Uh, like I mentioned before, uh, the City of Philadelphia does have an uh, energy benchmarking disclosure requirement, and they also have uh, a major focus on reducing citywide building energy use by 10% by 2015. This is one of their steps forward on that. So wherever you are on this webinar, you know, whatever city you're in, you might want to see what's going on there. There's, there could be sustainability initiatives. The fact that Philadelphia has an office of sustainability, uh, they've got a number of employees there that are really focused on making uh, the city of Philadelphia one of the most sustainable cities in the, in the country. Uh, it's, it's a lot of good things going on, and they're developing all kinds of programs that include a focus on buildings and things like that, and they are referencing a lot of these standards. So one more thing I wanted to mention is if you look at where we are today, you know, if we look at uh, typical construction techniques in buildings, we're, we're really down here. You know, code, code is basically just meeting the intent of the law so the building doesn't fall down and kill people or blow down in a storm. And ultimately, we want to keep pushing up this, this bar to getting to a point where we're really getting to more sustainable design. But eventually, we want to push even further. So... We can definitely say that a lot of these green building standards have pushed us up this ladder, making buildings more, you know, much better. However, there's a long way to go. You know, eventually when we get up in here, we can hit net zero where we're not really making a lot of impact on uh, the planet. We're using, you know, we're basically using as much energy as we can generate. But ultimately we want to get up to this area where I've been talking about regenerative design, trying to figure out how a building can not only uh, house people, but it can maybe absorb carbon or generate more electricity than it consumes or recycle and harvest water. And, you know, if we can do uh, these things, it's going to be really valuable. So keep that in mind that we, we, we are doing better, but we really have a long way to go to make buildings a lot better. 
One of the last things I wanted to mention before I go into questions was, uh, you know, there's a major push right now on putting a value on natural capital. So think about it. Uh, we've been talking a lot about buildings and standards and, you know, every building, everything that we do in our lives, we're using resources and we're impacting the environment. Every one of us on this phone and on this webinar is responsible for impact. You know, whether if you drive a car, if you take a shower, you use water, you buy food, you know, we all are creating impact. And the one thing we don't do a very good job at all is measuring those impacts that we do, we have on ecosystem services like water purification, air purification, you know, the fact that trees generate oxygen for us and, you know, recycle carbon dioxide. And there's a major movement now to try to put a dollar value on that. And one thing that's really interesting is if we start to do that, we're going to see that uh, natural capital, number one, should have a value and that the profits that some of these companies report or some of us report are really not going to be that high if we factor in the impacts to the environment and to, like I said, our ecosystem services. There are a number of organizations that are doing uh, their own carbon taxation, I guess you could call it. Uh, I know Microsoft is doing this where each division within Microsoft is responsible for their carbon footprint and they're having to pay money uh, on you know, the carbon they generate in that particular division you know, maybe 10, 20, 30 dollars a ton of CO2 and that's then being used to fund projects within Microsoft to reduce overall impact. So that's one step but you know ideally what we want to see is you know what is what is the value of a watershed? You know what is the value of um, the system services that are provided by you know trees that absorb CO2? You know things like that and putting a value to that and I think that's that's going to be something that's coming you know, so keep your eye on this because we'll start to see more of it. So in summary, before I go into questions here, there, there's definitely, as you can see, we have a lot of tools for making buildings more sustainable. Uh, I definitely think it's imperative that we all step forward and, and start to make buildings more sustainable. Uh, the, the goal should be, you know, thinking about how can we reduce impacts, you know, how, how can we uh, drive technology changes. And, you know, there is a major need for making products greener and closing the loop. Um, I, I just did recently did a TEDx talk on closing the loop, and uh, my focus on that was really to educate the average person to understand what that means. And in our current system, you know, we basically manufacture all these products that are disposable, and we're losing just tons of resources out there. So one thing that I think we really need to focus on is making our products better, closing the loop, designing things to be reused, recycled, and turned back into their, you know, into similar products. And then we are really limited on our technology, so there's major advances required in technology to help us mainstream net zero and eventually regenerative buildings. So again, huge opportunity here. If you're someone who's entrepreneurial or innovative, you know, there's a lot of options here to figure out ways to make, uh, you know, create these new technologies that we really need. So with that, I just wanted to say uh, thank you for joining. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in now uh, to a couple quick questions. Uh, first question I have here is what is the most uh, prevalent and widely recognized standard for new residential and commercial buildings? Well, I can tell you that um, depending on who you poll and what area of the world you're in, I would say LEED has a, a very strong hold there. But again, my point of today's discussion was to point out that there are many other standards out in the market and they are starting to really gain traction. So, uh, you know, keep that in mind that uh, you know, LEED is, lead is a great uh, system. It's really helped change the market and that's it's met its intent. However, it's not the only system out there and like I said before, none of these systems are perfect. Um, bottom line, uh, a lot of people could be doing a lot more and if they take lessons learned from all the standards and codes that are out there, they can really make some big changes. Uh, next question I got is how do I begin to choose the best green building rating system for my building project? Well, I think you really have to look at um, all the aspects. Uh, like I said, you want to look at what are the costs going to be, what are the implications. I think that we also need to consider that you just don't want to certify your building for construction. You want to figure out how you're going to operate it in the most sustainable manner. And whether that's following some standard or establishing your own standards internally, I think that's really important. Uh, another question I got is a product manufacturer, how do I make sure my products are meeting the requirements, all, all the green building codes and standards. Well, 
there's a lot of them out there, and one thing that you can do is definitely do an analysis of these uh, different codes and standards. That's something we've helped a lot of companies do. Uh, we, we do these assessments to basically see, we call it a green build, uh, like a green product assessment, where we try to determine what are the various aspects of the product and how would it meet the various uh, codes or standards or requirements within these, these uh, green building standards and codes. And it's uh, a great way to do that. Uh, next question I got is how do I continue to stay uh, current on what and where the green building codes and standards are being adopted or required? Well, there's no real easy answer for that. I have not found one repository for this. This is research that we do on a regular basis. Uh, we do a lot of this for some of the companies we work for that are very interested in knowing what's going on in the marketplace. Uh, it is important to monitor. Uh, if you're looking at energy, there's a really great website called Desire that can at least give you information on what's going on in different areas for energy. I highly recommend that. And then, uh, you know, the other thing would be is just to, you know, look at different uh, databases and, and try searching. You know, Google searches have been very helpful for us. But I don't have just one green building uh, database that I've ever seen. We, we typically are doing in-depth research on each of these different uh, codes and standards and, and requirements that are out there. I have one other one. Uh, question is, is Green Globes actually green? Seems to me it's purely for industry to get out of responsibility. Well, I guess you could look at everybody has an opinion and a, a thought about that. Bottom line is there are specific requirements in Green Globes. There are specific requirements in the NGBS. There are specific requirements in LEED. And they all focus on really trying to make buildings um, more sustainable. Uh, the level of how robust these things are varies. So um, I do think Green Globe serves a purpose. I do think NGBS serves a purpose. I do think LEED serves a purpose. So I won't I won't say that um, you know one is better than the other, but I do say that as an, your organization needs to look at your options and decide you know what what standard you want to use and what's going to provide the most benefit to you as an organization for both not only your construction or renovation or operations but really for the the integrating it into your business strategy as part of your sustainability initiatives so very very good to keep that in mind all right i have one more question i got here uh, i know my building will be undergoing a major renovation within the next 5 years what should we do to prepare, uh, knowing we will want to create a greener space? Meet a green building rating system is the question. Well, that is one method, and uh, what I would recommend there, if you know you're going to be doing something like this, you want to definitely look at what's going on. The, the market is changing, so five years from now, things could be a lot different. There might be new technologies, but I would say you definitely want to focus on, number one, saving energy, saving water, and making that space as environmentally uh, you know, as healthy as possible for the occupants and as, to make them as productive as possible. So again, keep, keep in mind that you want to really think about these things, whether you go with a green building rating system or not. These are very key aspects, and ultimately you want your employees or the people using that space to feel good. You want to know that you're doing your best to reduce energy consumption. You want to save water, and you really ultimately want to reduce your carbon footprint. It's, it's, and it's all about having an effective overall sustainability strategy and building that into your thinking as far as uh, integrating that in your business strategy. So, you know, keep that in mind. And, and that, that leads me into my last uh, slide here. Uh, I am actually having a seminar on May 7th in Philadelphia called Corporate Responsibility Revolution uh, Strategy to Success. And uh, for those of you that are really interested in sustainability and you're active in working in your different organizations, this is going to be an excellent seminar. There's nothing like this that I've seen out there, and I, I've, I've been teaching sustainability for many years. Uh, this is meant for folks that are, you know, have knowledge. This is not a sustainability 101. This is for people that have uh, an existing program or are starting an existing program, and you want to make it better. You want to get employee engagement. You want to get management commitment. You want to save money. You want to use it as a sales tool. We're going to be delving into this in this hands-on seminar on May 7th. So. Uh, we have very limited seating on this, and it's filling up pretty quickly. So if you're interested, I'd recommend you uh, register now. And uh, this follows a blog series that I've been doing. So you know, keep this in mind that uh, this will be a great event. So this puts us near the end, and it uh, looks like I've answered the majority of the questions. Uh, so 
If anybody has anything additional, please feel free to email me. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to you know, answer questions offline. And uh, I do have information here on uh, you know, my, my company as well as my blog. And a lot of people have been emailing and providing input, and that's really helpful to us. So again, thank you for coming. Again, I apologize for the technical difficulty we had with the, the little glitch with the PowerPoint getting stuck. But uh, I hope all of you got some good information out of here. And again, keep in mind, uh, there's a lot of activity in the world. And let's all do our part to make a difference in the world and, and figure out how we can uh, you know, really make sustainability uh, a mainstream activity for all of our organizations and people uh, around the, 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 the world. So thank you again, and have a great rest of the day.